Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, almost afternoon. Uh, thank you all so much for joining our 20, uh, 2024 uh, kickoff uh, webinar to share the DCYF agency request legislation and decision package summary and submission. Um, I'm Allison Pretzinger, our Director of Public Affairs here at the agency, and I'll let my colleague Renee introduce herself as well. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm Renee Newkirk, our Chief Financial Officer for DCYF. Renee and I are uh, excited to join you all today to present the culmination of a lot of hard work by our staff, our partners, our providers, our stakeholders in the community to inform our 24 set of legislative asks or asks that we've submitted as part of the DP and ARL process. A few housekeeping things and then we'll dive in. Uh, we're in webinar format, so there is a Q&A or question and answer icon at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to use that. You can add type questions um, and we can answer them. Some will answer live. Some we may answer in uh, in chat. Some we may not know the answer to, and we'll certainly find a follow up on those. So uh, feel free to use that. We'll pause throughout as we as we go and and respond to questions that may come up. Um, so we want to go ahead and go to the next slide. For folks who have joined us before for these, this is really just a graphic to illustrate the timeline of our role as well as the governor's office and OFM and the state legislature as we ramp into and uh, prepare for slash go through and complete every legislative cycle. Um, this shows that we're in that fall area where we have submitted our decision packages and agency requests legislations and are uh, in the moment where the governor's office, uh, the governor will build his budget that we anticipate for release mid to late December. And then we join uh, in Olympia for the kickoff of session in early January, which will set the set the agenda for the for the year. So we're in that phase um, and uh, are excited to be sharing what we've submitted today. Go ahead and go to the next slide. To ground us, I like to talk about the principles that guide the agency as we build agency request legislation. We'll talk a little bit of the realities that led to this specific build, but to sort of ground in the macro context, really there are four principles that drive and guide our work. Uh, we are, as our foundational strategic priority tells us, we're focused on uh, advancing and prioritizing investment and resource that reduce racial and ethnic disparities um, and, and eliminate uh, improved disparities that exist in our in our programs and our outcomes for young people um, and children, youth and families in our care. We also are prioritizing uh, resource investments and asks that focus on our core responsibilities outlined in our strategic plan, focus on our outcome goals, really improving outcomes, uh, prioritizing prevention and intervention services that prevent deeper penetration into systems of care, um, and certainly looking at programs that have a demonstrated evidence or promising practice base to really drive outcomes. So uh, those are some of the guiding principles that inform and influence us as we build towards each legislative cycle. The next slide is a little busier. <laughs> this is the agency timeline as we think about building towards this supplemental, this 24 supplemental set of asks. Um, uh, Working towards legislative asks is an ongoing process. It happens year round. It happens all the time. The legislature comes to town every January. And, and throughout the year as we go, we are having conversations internally and with partners to say, you know, what challenges do we need to solve for? How can we move the needle? What needs a legislative strategy on investment, a law change versus what can we just do? And consistently having those conversations. And so each uh, typically winter, spring, we sort of, launch the formal deadline process, the formal process for the next set of priorities. Uh, many of the things you'll see today uh, shouldn't be surprising and have been in, in the works for, for many of years. Um, and then, you know, we move through sort of formalizing those, building cost models, making the case, stakeholdering, iterating, getting feedback. Some ideas just aren't all the way ready and move to a future year, um, whereas some ideas move forward. And so that's what you'll see today is the set that move forward. I want to go to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about the more present realities diving into this legislative session. Uh, so as folks know, uh, this is a supplemental year. What that means is it's a short session. It's 60 days in duration. It is really intended to be a session of tweaks and modifications to investments, the budget, bills that passed in, in the previous year. Um, this is not a, the year for, this is not a year for uh, big, innovative, system-wide initiatives or changes. Uh, that's not really what happens in a supplemental session. It moves pretty quickly. It's intended to be modifications 
and tweaks. And that's the direction that comes to the agency, comes to Renee and I from our authorizing environment in the governor's office and OFM. So that's one factor that we consider as we build our, our set of priorities heading into this session. The other is um, DCYF is, as many of you know, implementing significant investment and policy changes from the last few years. We saw significant changes in our child welfare space, uh, in our JR space with JR to 25 implementation and CTS, uh, significant investments and advancements in early learning with the Fair Start for Kids Act, uh, federal dollars and grants. So there is a lot of work happening inside the agency uh, that has yielded change, positive change, change that drives us in the direction we were intended to go and why we were created. Um, but we are a system and an agency of humans. And there's only so much change that systems and humans can take on at any given time. So given all that is happening, we also take that into consideration as we think about what can we take on in the next couple of years through this legislative set of asks. The other reality that is always true and, and always is a factor for us and the authorizing environment set forward is the overall revenue and economic picture. Um, although revenues continue to be in the economic reality continues to be strong for many and most in Washington state, it's certainly not equal. And there is uncertainty about what the future holds. Uh, revenue growth has slowed in Washington state um, and there's projected slowing in the out years, which influences again, our direction and our authorization of sort of how much, how big, et cetera. So you couple all those things together in this really scientific equation that we create here at the agency. Um, and we sort of end up with a limited scope of requests. So what you're gonna see um, as we move forward are things that are likely familiar, things that we've been talking about for a number of years. You'll see some rate asks, rate modifications. You'll see uh, early adopter, early implementation type programs. You'll see the next set of phases in the early learning space, all of which will, many of which will look familiar from previous years. Um, but we're not, this is not a moment where the agency has put forward big, new, bold, innovative um, ideas. It's really sort of what's next in, in where we were headed and where we're going that makes sense. The next slide, which will serve as our transition slide, and Renee and I will sort of tag team back and forth as we move through the buckets of the agency. This is intended just to summarize all of it <laughs> in one slide. We've really broken it down into four some themes and themes that you'll see here on the slide. I won't read them all to you, but we're gonna walk through all of these slides um, and all of these decision packages and the one agency request together over the next 45 or so minutes. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Renee to kick us off and dive through some of the details. Thank you, Allison. So as you can see on this slide and thinking about what we were to put forward in our 2024 supplemental budget request, we thought about it in these different four categories, supporting staff necessary to implement the 2325 laws, supporting core agency needs and maintaining forward progress towards agency goals. As you'll note, supporting staff is a category in of itself, very deserving. So I'll use that as a segue and transition to the next slide as I'll first uh, review staff, staff safety and supports. I will note this is Secretary Hunter's top priority request. This request is for supports for the entire agency, but acknowledging the most need is for our child welfare social workers and JR staff working directly with the JR population. With the population changing where we're serving more children with complex needs and children and youth in need of mental health and behavioral health supports, the number of trauma incidents that's occurring to our staff is increasing, and this has not gone unnoticed. Hence, where we're putting forward this request in support of our staff for our staff safety and supports for them. The request includes um, contracts for mental health. We acknowledge that although there's single traumatic incidents, there's also the day-to-day -day just trauma and crisis that our frontline workers are experiencing. So we wanna ensure that they have the support such as the mental health contracts, stipends for staff that are volunteering to assist those other workers in crisis and be able to respond to the crisis, um, staff and specialists within each region to provide the on-site supports as it's needed as incidents are occurring, and safety specialists to support the safety in our offices statewide. So this is a large um, FTE ask, but also contracted support for mental health contracts really in support of our staff to ensure that they have all the supports necessary to support them as they're serving our clients and on the front lines of, um, of our work. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Stipends for lived experience. 
In uh, the two, 2022 legislative session, there is the passage of second substitute Senate Bill 5793, which allows for compensation for lived experience on boards, commissions, councils, committees, and other similar groups. The legislation said that it was subject to available funding that we may provide stipends and a stipend will not exceed $200 to individual per, um, per, uh, per participation. Um, however, we do not have the funding, hence why we put forward this decision package to request funding so that we could compensate for lived experience. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. DS implementation. Uh, this is in regards to the settlement agreement on behalf of children and youth experiencing placement instability. We did receive funding in the 23-25 biennial budget. This is the current biennium to implement seven of the eight system improvements. We did not request, therefore not receive funding for the eighth system improvement, hence why we're putting for forward this decision package request, requesting for that eighth system improvement, which is the family group planning. Family group planning required stakeholder feedback, so we wanted the opportunity to go through the stakeholdering process, receive the feedback, and put forward a request. So based on the feedback we received, um, it includes improving the format of the family group planning meetings, strengthening youth engagement, and have consistent practice in the facilitation of the meetings to ensure that the meetings occur more often with more advanced notice, as well as support for families and youth who are participating in the meetings. Ensure there's an experience assigned facilitator who maintains a consistent presence throughout the entirety of the case, as well as standardizing family group planning meetings, creating consistent job duties for facilitators, providing training, guidance, and supervision. So based off this feedback, um, we propose to update the FTDM model to include early engagement, safety-focused meetings, placement decisions, and permanency, to provide youth, parents, and caregivers with an opportunity to have an orientation to meetings, receive agendas before the meetings, allow the families to identify additional topics, and um, time without the agency to discuss key elements before the plan is agreed upon. So family group planning implementation is included in this request as well as the agreement requires a DCYF to develop new placement settings for children and youth experiencing instability, so requesting resources to support that effort, as well as funding to pay our legal fees. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Emergent placement services. Emergent placement services, this is a short-term placement that's provided when no other placement is available for children and youth with the intensive support needs. EPS was established by the legislature in 2018. Therefore, the rate is outdated. We have not received a rate increase in this area since it became effective and created. Um, so we're putting forward the request for a rate increase to fully cover the cost of this service. And although, you know, we acknowledge that the foster care population is decreasing, yet we're seeing an increase in the acuity of the mental and behavioral health supports that are needed for the youth in our care. So we're requesting to establish additional emergent short-term and medium-term license placements across the state to meet this need as well. So that's also included in this request. Okay, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Community-based FRS. FRS is a voluntary program serving adolescents and youth in conflict with their families with the goal to reunify and strengthen the family. We acknowledge that families struggle to access um, services relevant to their needs. Families of color are disproportionately impacted by lack of access to culturally responsive services. DCYF requests to transition to a community-based provision with the goal of serving more families with culturally appropriate prevention services. In this request, we're requesting three early adopter implementation sites, which include King, Pierce, and Yakima counties. The community-based FRS model was co-designed with community in a year-long process that started in the June of 2022. Participants in the co-design process included youth and families with lived experience, tribes, community providers, and other stakeholders. The co-design participants identified referral pathways, program model and design, and selected the three early implementation sites of King, Pierce, and Yakima counties based on racial disproportionality by region. Um, it's also worth noting that the co-design will continue to provide insight through the implementation that through this request we're requesting to begin in July of 2024. 
Also included in this request is funding for WISIP to evaluate these three implementation sites. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. The basic foster care maintenance payment increase. Um, we submitted a decision package for a basic foster care maintenance payment increase and EFC housing supplement, but there's two separate slides for each component. So in this slide, um, this covers the basic foster care maintenance payment increase. Um, we do acknowledge there was an increase provided by the legislature for this current biennium of $50 um, each month to address um, increased costs by inflation. However, the $50 does not cover the cost of inflation. Uh, a basic foster care maintenance payment is intended to cover food, clothing, housing, personal incidentals. So we've gone through a cost analysis and we are requesting um, by age groups. So birth to five, we're requesting additional $173 per month the age group of 6 to 11, an additional $254, and ages 12 and up, an additional $174 per month as our basic foster care maintenance payment rate increase. Um, it's also worth noting that we receive funding for a caregiver supports package in this current biennium, which includes transitioning our maintenance payments from a four-level system to a seven-level system. This does not impact the funding or implementation of that caregiver supports package. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So the EFC housing supplement component of this decision package um, is a request to pay for a housing supplement payment in the counties with high cost housing to our EFC youth. As I just previously discussed the basic foster care maintenance payment, EFC youth who are in a supervised independent living arrangement receive that basic foster care payment with currently with the $50 increase is $860 a month. That's just not sufficient and not sufficient for um, to support the EFC youth and their housing expenses. So requesting this housing supplement in high cost counties. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. We're requesting funding for independent living investments. Independent living is a voluntary program that's designed to teach important life skills to current and former foster youth. This funding request includes a couple different components, uh, funding to sustain the independent living program, new and increased independent living rate, as well as sustaining our adolescent transition program managers. To sustain the independent living program, it's important to note that this program is funded through a federal Chafee grant. The federal Chafee grant is allocated to states based on the proportionate share of children and youth in foster care. So as our population is declining, our federal grant is also declining. Therefore, we're requesting backfill of this loss in federal funding with state funds. A new and increased independent living rate also want to note that in this current biennium, there was one-time funding provided to our independent living providers. However, it's not sufficient to move our payment from a budget-based to a case-based payment. Under a case-based payment, our goal is to provide the adequate funding to providers, fully cover their cost of care, as well as including their ability to pay their staff a living wage and retain staff. The third component of this decision package is adolescent transition program managers. Uh, the previous budget, 21-23 budget, provided one-time funding for program managers. It was not ongoing funding, so we're requesting this funding to maintain, sustain those existing program managers for the betterment of this program. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide, we'll get into a couple of IT investments here. We're requesting to replace our SSPS system. This is our social service payment system. So it is a payment system. It's a system in which we pay our providers. It is very old, antiquated, very difficult for us to attract staff to maintain the system. There's just, we're finding it increasingly difficult for um, staff that have skills and abilities to maintain this very, very old system as it's not current technology. Um, so as I noted, it is a payment system as well as functionality of generating invoices, tax reporting, generates letters, notifications to providers, a whole host of um, abilities within the SSPS system, very critical for us. 
Um, this is a placeholder request. By a placeholder request, I mean when we submitted this decision package, we did not submit it with a specific dollar amount that we're requesting as we're currently going through a feasibility study, which is being finalized, wrapping up right now currently. Um, and once we have that feasibility study finalized, we can better understand the considerations and formulate an estimate of how much it would cost for us to replace the system, which then will partner, work with the Office of Financial Management and the legislature, provide them with what those estimates are. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Our second uh, technology request is a CWA system. This is a comprehensive child welfare information system. It's a child welfare case management system. The federal government is encouraging all states to move towards modular based case management system. So if there's one particular portion of a system that needs to be updated, we just update that one modular versus the entire system, which is very costly. Um, also, our current case management system does not allow us to keep pace and make updates to um, updates in state and federal laws, policy changes. Um, also, this system would allow us better day-to-day -day case management and support social workers in that as well as a new um, CWA system would allow us to draw down additional federal funds. And by additional federal funds, I'm referring to our Title IV-E FFPSA funding. Uh, FFPSA requires certain data elements that we must submit in order to draw down that funding stream. Our current case management system does not collect those data points, so therefore we're not able to provide that to the federal government to take advantage and draw down those federal dollars. So this would all also allow us to take advantage of drawing down additional federal dollars. This also was uh, submitted as a decision package uh, request as a placeholder, much like SSPS. We're wrapping up the um, feasibility study now and we'll work with the Office of Financial Management and the legislature to provide them with those um, estimates once that feasibility study is completed. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Allison to walk through our early learning investment requests. Great, thanks so much, Renee. Uh, I'm gonna walk through uh, our early learning asks and our one piece of agency request legislation. Uh, for folks who have joined us before and been paying attention to our work, much of what you're gonna see today will look familiar. Uh, we follow the same theme and buckets that we followed last year related to our early learning asks. Uh, so I'm first gonna talk about investments to continue to make improvements to the child care system the child care subsidy system to make it better and work more work better for families. I was going to say work more better, but that probably doesn't make sense grammatically. Uh, work better for families. Um, I will note that what you're going to see here in, in the three early learning asks are really continuation. The three main early learning asks are going to are continuation of things we asked for last year. I do want to remind folks uh, that are joining us that we have a massive amount of work underway related to the cost of care and shifting to a cost of care model away from market rate survey, as well as some key milestones that come up in the next biennial budget related to the Fair Start for Kids Act. So although these investments are critical, they're great next steps, and they're super important, um, they are not some of the system change elements that we anticipate to be submitting in the biennial budget next year. So I just think that's very important context as we think about what's next in the, in the child care and early learning space. So as we think about how do we continue to make improvements to the child care subsidy system to make it work better for families, we're really focused on a couple of things. As folks will remember, eligibility for child care is dependent on income as well as activity. So do you income qualify? And then are you working, engaged in activities that indicate you need full part-time or full-time care for your child? That's really the, the way the subsidy system has worked for a number of years, largely since um, a welfare reform in the early 90s. Folks will remember and know that the child care subsidy system is largely funded and uh, influenced by the federal requirements, the child care development block grants and our CCDF funding and plan. Uh, so that's really sort of some of the history and context around how the subsidy system works. I think important to ground us in. Um, so what are we asking for in this space to support families better accessing child care this year? Really, there's three main components. Um, when we think about approved activities, we want to really provide some flexibility and, a, and broader expand what are considered approved activities for families to be able to be eligible for Working Connections Child Care Subsidy. And so we're asking for uh, allowances that participation in ECAP, Early ECAP, Head Start, or Early Head Start are an approved activity for a family. So families engaged in one of those programs, that would be their activity because we know there's family support components. We know there's engagement in those programs to mitigate and be working on um, 
uh, family support elements. And, and so really allowing those to be approved activities would then allow for that eligibility. When we think about income, uh, we are, I'm gonna jump to the third bullet, sorry. <laughs> when we think about income, uh, that's the other component. And we know we currently have to count child support orders as income, SSI payments, uh, social security uh, income and supplemental security income. We are asking for an allowance to exclude those three things from the income element for families. We know especially true around child support is there may be a child support order between two parents, but the, the guardian or the parent in where the child is living is actually not receiving consistent or full payments from that order, yet we currently have to count that order income towards the family's income. And so asking for allowability to exclude those three categories of income for families, we anticipate about 1,500 children will gain access uh, based on that policy change. And then the last one is um, we wanna provide households with a child who's receiving child protective services or protective services one year of working connections eligibility following permanency by adoption or guardianship. I do wanna note that permanency towards reunification already comes with 12 months of child care authorization, child care subsidy. That's why you don't see it on this slide. We already do that. Um, this is really about expanding that to those who achieve permanency through a guardianship or uh, adoption. And then the last piece here is FTE to continue to support families with accessing high quality early learning programs, additional support to, to manage the workload. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So folks will recall last year and this year we have, how do we support families and how do we support providers in continuing to make progress in the childcare space? Um, we know that the childcare industry, the childcare market is still very, very much insufficiently resourced, very much in crisis. Providers cannot afford to pay their workforce more. Families cannot pay more for care. We're in a workforce challenge in childcare like many other, many other of our frontline workforce and our contracted services across the agency um, and across human services in general. Um, we know that is especially true for our childcare providers. And so in light of what is coming next biennium, which will be a large ask related to and shifting to our, towards the cost of care and some increased eligibility, we know it's important to continue to make progress and invest in supporting the workforce and supporting providers. And so there's a couple of components that we're asking here. Uh, one is an idea that we have not yet implemented, but has been talked about for a long time. And that is the allowability of contracted slots through childcare. For folks who may not know, childcare subsidy is a family voucher program, meaning the family becomes eligible. They're eligible for that subsidy and a family chooses where to go for childcare. They then go, they secure that childcare and then the state reimburses the childcare provider, the cost of care based on the rate for the age region, the family pays a copay portion of that. Unlike our state-funded preschool program, which is contracted slots, where we have a contractual relationship with a provider to have a slot, offer a slot, hold that slot open uh, for, for children to enroll, preschool children to enroll, we really want to begin to explore how do we do contracted slots in childcare, and really think it's important to start with a uh, population that is uh, really mission critical to DCYF. So we really want to start contracted slots and we want to start by infants who are involved in and receiving protective services either at home or uh, who have been removed and so really this provides authorization and resource to begin that contracted slot work with with providers um, and and infants who are involved in our child welfare system also we also uh, recognize infant care like all care but infant care especially being really hard to find and the most expensive care uh, to offer. And so we wanna increase the infant rate enhancement to $500. We also wanna increase the non-standard hours bonus rate for all ages to 500. That's care in the evenings and on the weekends. There was a small investment in the non-standard hours rate last year, but the report we did a couple of years ago suggested a $500 bonus, uh, $500 enhancement was the right level. So this decision package will get us to that $500 as outlined in the report that we had produced and done. We also will ask again to align our overpayment collection methodology and process with federal requirements. Right now, Washington State uh, 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 overpayment collection process exceeds what the feds require. And so we really just wanna recalibrate and move to what the feds require. And then we're asking for some resources to continue to invest in, expand our shared service and technical assistance for accessing funding, accessing resources and sort of, and sort of pro supporting providers uh, with their business work. So that's our provider-focused decision package. I'm gonna to move to the next slide. Along with those, you'll see an ECAP decision package. Again, very, very similar to the last couple of years, 
Um, this decision package is like last year has three components. The first being about the rates. We did a rate model a couple of years ago. Our decision package last year asked for a 40% rate increase. We got about 20% of that funded or 20% rate increase on average. So this decision package asks for the difference between that the the what was funded last year and what the rate model says is necessary to meet the um, meet the requirements in the ECAP space um, and necessary to pay uh, to pay fully for those slots. We also have an entitlement on the books uh, for families, children under 135% federal poverty, or I think that's right, coming. I may get that wrong. I may get that exact number wrong. These numbers fly around. Anyway, there's an entitlement on the books by 20 uh, in, a, in a number of years. And so in a couple of years, so we need to keep marching towards slot expansion. So we're asking for 250 slots this year to build on the 500 that are already funded for the supplemental, which would allow about 750 new slots to roll out next school year if funded. And then a little bit of resource for quality support. So cover funding to cover things like teaching strategies, gold, curriculum, child assessment, some of the other quality support components that sit outside that rate. That is our ECAP decision package. Go ahead and go to the next slide. As folks will recall last year, the legislature passed House Bill 1550. A component of that bill was about coordinated recruitment and enrollment for DCYF and OSPI to support collaboration and connection of uh, early learning programs on the ground in local community as more and more types of early learning emerge in given communities. Uh, a value of Washington State's early learning system is our mixed delivery model. Uh, parents, uh, guardians, caregivers can choose childcare and early learning opportunities in a variety of settings in our state. And that is a value that is very, very important for the continuity and growth of our early learning system. Settings look like licensed homes. They look like centers. They look like nonprofits. They look like for-profits. They look like schools. They look like CBOs, municipalities outdoor learning opportunities. Um, there are a variety of entities that offer or high quality early learning in our state. And we want to ensure that mixed delivery values live. As part of the transition to kindergarten work, there was an acknowledgement that there needs to be support for that coordinated recruitment and enrollment on the ground. Unfortunately, with final passage of that bill, that element was not funded. And so we have a decision package this year to ask for resources that would exist in partnership with OSPI and through our child care aware network to support some of that coordination on the ground between um, the varying types of early learning programs and providers that may exist in a given community. Uh, there's a question in the chat, is the TK item also in OSPI's DP? Um, OSPI follows a different timeline than DCYF because they are not a cabinet level agency. They are a separately elected. So their decision packages are not yet final. We have been in conversation and collaboration with OSPI on coordinated recruitment and enrollment for a number of years. I anticipate we may see something from OSPI that is a complement to and supports continued coordinated and recruitment and enrollment from their perspective as well, um, and have more dialogue about that with them coming. And I'm not sure what their final decision packages look like yet. You want to go ahead and go to the next slide. So our one, one piece of agency request legislation this year is related to our early supports for infants and toddlers program. We are asking for uh, a statute change to allow uh, payment on the first day ESIT services again, uh, begin in the first month of service. Right now, the law uh, says that the billing begins the, the first full month or the next month and looking for uh, adjustment to that. So ESIT, payment ESIT payments can begin on that first day in that first month of service. This is a decision package, obviously, as well as agency request legislation because it will require a statute change. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm going to turn it back over to Renee to talk about our couple of juvenile rehabilitation uh, investments. Thank you, Allison. So in regards to juvenile rehabilitation, we are submitting a decision package for Echo Glen Security. We receive funding in our capital budget to construct a perimeter fence around the campus. However, until that fence is constructed, we need to maintain and ensure that it is a secure campus. It is a medium maximum facility in Snoqualmie, Snoqualmie. And so we're requesting funding for contracted security to secure around uh, the Echo Glen Children's Center to ensure that we maintain staff safety, um, safety of the, the youth there and the young adults, as well as the community. So requesting this contracted uh, security guards to ensure that there is safety around Echo Glen. This is, um, 
important as we've had some recent escapes and staff assaults. So um, just really want to ensure that we have that safety and security until that fence is fully constructed. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Also requesting funding in, in regards to a class action settlement, we're requesting to establish a hearings unit to serve the individuals under the age of 25 that are transferring to the Department of Corrections. Under RCW 1340 to 80, individuals transferring to the Department of Corrections have a right to a hearing. This re request is made as a result of a lawsuit against the agency. So to come into compliance and also just do what's right by these individuals under the age of 25 by establishing this hearing unit, um, this is, is our response to that to ensure that those individuals receive a hearing. Okay, and that is actually it for uh, the juvenile rehabilitation requests. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Allison in closing. Great. Thanks so much, Renee. There's a couple questions in the chat that I want to address. One, uh, I apologize, Joel, uh, you are correct. I'm, I failed to include in the making child care work for families, the exclusion of child support, social security, and su supplemental income is for, is for subsidy and ECAP. Uh, so that is for both provider groups. So families who are in, uh, contemplating enrollment in either subsidy or ECAP, we are asking that that income not be counted. So just note that there. Sorry, I apologize. I misspoke. It is for both providers, uh, both programs, subsidy and ECAP. And there is also a question about uh, how do we find out what each of the seven classification levels entails? This is about the provider supports, or I'm sorry, the caregiver supports package um, that Renee, I think, talked about, mentioned while she was talking about the foster care uh great increase payment. There is information on our website about the shift we asked for and was funded last year related to the caregiver supports levels. I will note that the payments uh, changes roll out January 1, and the services and supports that come with that will roll out later. That is not yet in place. And so more information forthcoming, um, both in direct communication with caregivers, guardians, providers, as that work rolls out. Um, and then I will just note in closing, all of our decision packages are posted on our website, the DCYF website for ease of finding. They're on the government, of page, government affairs page there. It's broken down in maintenance level and policy level requests. As we have one pagers that are updated on these requests, we will add those to the DCYF webpage as well. Um, but wanna let folks know that that's where you can go uh, to find DPs should you wanna peruse you know, between four and 15 pages of uh, lovely reading. Uh, there is a question around when will working connections for staff be implemented? Donna, I believe you are talking about the bill that passed last year. I'll note this is not an implementation webinar, um, but happy to give a brief update because we do have time. Some communication will be going out to providers uh, in the coming days. Unfortunately, DSHS and barcode implementation of that change will be delayed and that will not go live October 1. I know DSHS and barcode as well working as quickly as they can. Um, on the updates related to 5225, which I believe is the bill number of that bill passed last year. Uh, communication will be going out with more of a timeline directly to providers this week um, or early next on that. We're, we're disappointed by the delay, um, but unfortunately that's just the reality of our antiquated uh, technology systems that we share with DS DSHS for implementation or for eligibility of program. So uh, thanks for asking that question and child care providers uh, and others should be on the lookout for uh, communication soon. Um, with that, that concludes the formal content. We do have time. It's only 1140. Renee and I are getting real good at breezing through these. Um, and, and many of this is familiar. I would argue there are probably less questions because of the robust stakeholdering that happens by our teams and many of your engagement through the process over the year or years informing, influencing, engaging in these asks. But um, Renee and I'll hang on and see if there's any other questions. Please continue to use the Q&A button and uh, the Q&A feature and we'll continue to answer questions as, as they come in for the next 10 or so minutes.
I am on mute, I'm reading. Um, can you talk a bit more about the community-based FRS and the early counties, what will it entail? Uh, that's a great question. Um, that is definitely an implementation question. I think Renee and I have provided the level of detail that we're aware of at this point. Um, unfortunately, this is from an anonymous attendee, so I can't follow up directly with you. But if you wanted to send me an email, I'd be happy to connect you with staff inside DCYF who have really informed the build and development and members of the work group who also contributed through a design process with DCYF staff, external stakeholders around that. Um, it's uh, there's there's definitely more detail than Renee and I shared, um, but a lot of that is in implementation and in the design and the report. So um, happy to happy to share that if you want to send me an email or type your name in the chat so I know who you are and can follow up with you. Uh, yes, Donna, all of the DPs, all of our decision packages are posted on our website. I did check before uh, that. I was actually looking at them to answer some of Lori Lippold's questions as she was asking them. So those are all those are all posted on the website. Can you please link the chat or send the chat out after this session? Unfortunately, it's not a standard protocol for us to send chats out over the session. We do sometimes post Q&As or FAQs after webinars if we can't answer questions or more detail is needed. Um, but we have been able to answer all of these questions live um, and, or through the um, uh, live or through the Oh, please link in the, sorry for the clarification, the link to the DP page. I get it. I can't read. <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, we will. Um, let me see if I can post the link in the chat. I don't know how to do that from this seat, but let me see if I can do that. It's certainly on the dcyf.wa.gov. Drop down government affairs. They're right there on the main government affairs page. Uh, we'll get that out and we can also send a gov delivery email with it out as well to everyone who got this email can you go over the lived experience positions slide again are they peer navigator positions i'm assuming you're talking about the staff safety and seams proposal position the, the stipends maybe the stipends or the stipends i'm happy to talk about stipends the stipends proposal is a is um really about DCYF having monetary resource to reimburse folks with lived expertise who sit on advisory bodies, who sit in, sit on work groups, who are not there as part of their day-to-day -day job uh, with resources to sort of compensate them for their time. Um, these are not peer navigator positions. This is available to anyone who uh, contributes to an advisory group or a work group that, has, that brings the lived, ex lived experience perspective. Uh, another question, who is working on the exact details of the seven levels? There is there a person to follow up with? It's vague. Right now, everything is vague. Uh, we have seen a chart, but no further details. Um, we can certainly follow up. Um, uh, Sarah, I know you <laughs> in Fosterful. I can certainly follow up and connect you with uh, staff internally who are working on, um, I'm assuming you're talking about the uh, the contracted services side of that. Right now, there's been a lot of focus on the rates side of that because those go live in January, uh, but certainly can connect you with DCYF staff on the contracted services. How does DCYF plan to use the capital gains funding? Is the lived experience stipend based on FPL meaning income? Two separate questions. So uh, unfortunately, DCYF is not the legislature and we don't get to make choices about how revenues in this state are spent. We get to ask for things that we want and need um, and the legislature actually appropriates funding based on dollars coming into this quote unquote state bank account. So a little bit of 101 and I'll look to Renee to make sure I, I get this right. Um, the, the, the way the budgeting process works generally for the state is there's a lot of different revenue streams that come in. Property tax, sales tax, gas tax, capital gains tax, this fee, that fee, real estate tax. And they sort of all go in a pot of money or specific pots of money based on dedicated accounts that may exist. A couple of years ago, the legislature passed the capital gains tax. It passed alongside the same year that Fair Start for Kids Act passed. And there was a lot of dialogue about how we would use the state, the legislature would make choices to use capital gains tax to fund potential early learning investments. How that operationally looks is there is a 
um, education legacy trust account that exists. Allowable expenses in that account, account are laid out in statute, early learning being one of them, as well as schools, K-12 funding, and other things. And the legislature has made some choices to deposit parts of the capital gain revenue into that account and then pay for things like early learning and others out of that account. Um, DCYF doesn't do that. We don't control that. We don't get to like, we don't get a blank check that says, here's your capital gains revenue, spend away. All of that is approved through the legislature. So the legislature, when they pass a budget, they fund, you know, item X and they say item X costs $4 and we're going to fund it from this account or this revenue source. Sometimes that's federal, sometimes that's state, sometimes it comes from a specific account. But all those decisions are made by the legislative body, body through the budgeting process. And in fact, when we submit our decision packages, the things we say is, the things we, we put forward are, um, we can draw down X percent of federal dollars through 4E, through V, through childcare, through some other federal funding source we may have, um, but it's gonna cost this much in state dollars. We don't tell the legislature what account or what revenue source they should pay for that with. They make all of those choices in their budgeting process. Uh, there's a question about, oh, the second question of that is the lived experience stipend based on FPL or median income. I don't know that off the top of my head. I'd have to go back and look. That's part of the law um, and, and part of the guidance from the Office of Equity and will be part of implementation, which will roll out. I'm not, I'm not sure the, the exact breakdowns off the top of my head. Uh, children with significant medical issues placed uh, within the foster care system do not fit in the current system. Any plans to address that? Mark, I think you're talking about implementation of the seven caregiver levels. Uh, we have acknowledged that, that some of the most medically complex children sit out and beyond that seventh level or, or not fit within that system. And there are dialogue about how to continue some of those exceptional cost plans in certain situations where the medical needs far outpace the, the rate level. And so those conversations in under, are underway um, and, and, and don't fall in any of these decision packages, but are certainly part of the implementation uh, conversation and, and will likely continue to be addressed uh, through existing, existing resources. Uh, granted, I haven't read the DPs carefully. Thanks for the acknowledgement. <laughs> There's a lot of them. I get it. And you read a lot of agency DPs. I'm curious if you could say more about how folks with lived experience receive the siphon. In other words, do you anticipate managing the number of people with the amount of money who hopefully receive? Yeah. So great question. Um, this decision package was really about of the existing advisory bodies and work groups sort of globally across DCYF to fund the existing work groups and advisory bodies, we need this much resource to, to do that work and do that work ongoing. As new work groups or new advisories are spun up, we will ask for the stipends as part of that bill or part of that proviso. We have a calculator that we've developed in partnership with other agencies that in fact is being adopted sort of by a lot of state agencies, which is very exciting. So we will build those ongoing requests into any specific bill or proviso. These resources really looked at point in time what work groups exist, how do how many do we sort of guesstimate our folks with lived experience, um, and we anticipate having enough resource to support all that existing work, and we'll continue to ask for resource ongoing for the existing work, as well as any new advisory bodies that do come up. In the DP, why didn't DCYF ask for more funding for direct provider grant supports? Providers are still struggling financially. Uh, I assume you're talking about child care providers. Um, we agree that the, the funding for child care, the funding model doesn't work. And many child care providers, like many of our contracted service providers, are definitely still struggling. Um, we have grant money for fiscal year 24 for the equity grants, the complex needs grants, the tribal early learning grants. That was funded in the biennial budget. And so those grants will continue uh, to roll out over the, the next couple of fiscal years and are excited to be able to invest in those grants. Um, likely we'll see some biennial asks around grant expansion there. Um, as far as general grants, that was not something we had the authorization to ask for at scale. If you'll remember, those one-time grants that went out to providers were 100% federally funded with one-time dollars. And they are they were uh, robust in the quantity, the the volume of dollar necessary to go out the door to all providers. That was just something DCYF did not have an on ramp uh, for in authorizing this year. But we'll continue to roll out what we do have through the existing grant programs that do exist and designation programs. I 
think. Thank you for the questions. <laughs> Keep them coming. We're happy to hang on here. Uh, I think we are moving through most of them. I'm just scrolling back up to make sure I didn't miss any. I'm also trying to figure out if I can type my own so I can link to the website. Don't know how to do that, and I apologize. <laughs> I don't think it's actually possible. Oh, everyone. So in the chat, I can type to everyone. So I will pull up the link here and add this. Don't see any more questions coming in, but keep them coming if you have them. Here's the link to the government affairs webpage. And if you scroll down, You'll see 24 agency request legislation, 24 budget requests, policy level, maintenance level, decision packages. Renee and I covered today a combination of things that fall under policy level and maintenance level. So please make sure you click on both tabs to find the DPs you're looking for there. Please share in, st in the state statute, DCYF cannot ask for the basic grant funds. Yeah, so I want to clarify that's definitely not in statute <laughs> that we can't ask for things. Um, but when we are putting together, as I talked about at the top of this deck, and I'll turn it over to Renee too if she wants to add, but at the top of this deck, uh, when we began, there are a number of factors and direction that we are given from our authorizing environment, OFM and the governor around scope and scale heading into any given legislative session. And in a supplemental year for the reasons I named, our direction and our asks um, need to be about tweaks, modifications, smaller investments. Supplemental years are not the years that we are authorized through our directions by our bosses, uh, the cabinet level agency, um, to ask for big asks. So I don't know, Renee, if there's anything you'd want to add there about sort of budget direction that we're given. Yeah, in a supplemental year, it really is just to make requests to maintain current operations. Um, any sort of emergent, urgent um, needs, it's typically a supplemental year, we have a, a smaller number of requests. Um, and really, that's that's the direction that we're given for a supplemental year. Bigger asks come in the biennium, that's right. And as I noted, in the childcare space, what we'll be asking for next year in the biennial budget is pivoting to the cost of care model. Many childcare providers have been part of the design team work and the cost of care work underway for a number of years. The legislature through Fair Start for Kids Act and even predating that in, in 1344 in the child care collaborative task force work contemplated um, moving to the cost of care as the feds have allowed that and allowed and created a pathway for states to move from the market rate survey to the cost of care work. So we do anticipate having a large uh, biennial ask, a larger biennial ask that is about the cost of care. To what level, how far, unclear yet, though that math and that work is still underway. Um, but we do anticipate, and, and the cost of care really is about what does it cost to do quality child care at wages that are sufficient and comparable to the market and necessary. Um, so that that ask next year for, for cost of care uh, is definitely in in the in the works. Well, I will take this moment in a pause of questions coming in just to say thanks so much, everyone, for joining. I know folks are busy and have lots of competing interests and priorities, and Renee and I and the agency really appreciate your engagement in the webinar and the process all year and, and years to come to build these decision packages and agency request, request legislation. This is a huge milestone for us and our team to sort of get over this hurdle and now really pivot to the governor budget build and the legislative session. So thank you all uh, for your engagement in today and the process and really appreciate you all joining. Please do reach out if other questions come up or you're curious to learn uh, more about this set of asks or heading into the legislative session, I'm certainly available as is Renee and folks on our team to be supportive. So with that, we'll just say thank you all and 
uh, do reach out if anything else comes up. Hope everyone has a great weekend.